and recording. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I am super excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to be taking us away on inclusive or exclusive re-examining inclusive access textbook programs. Before I begin, a quick introduction. My name is Trudy Radke. I am an open education consultant and instructional technologist and designer and the project manager for inclusiveaccess.org. And I'm super excited to be with you today at Open Texas. All right, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with the goals for today of this presentation. First, we're gonna go ahead and review the background on the textbook industry shift to inclusive access models. Then we're gonna talk about the myths and facts and what questions you can ask about these models. And finally, we're gonna go over some resources to help you navigate inclusive access programs. So I always start with this um, statistic. If you've been in the open space, you're probably familiar with it. I start with it for two reasons. Um, I am professionally interested in open education, but I was also a first generation low income college student. Two in three students say they decided against buying a textbook because the cost is too high. Um, this stat resonates with me professionally and personally. And uh, I'm here to talk about the textbook industry shift into inclusive access and how that is still affecting our students' ability to afford their course materials. So we've talked a little bit about the type of presentation we're here to have today. Now, what is inclusive access? Inclusive access is a textbook sales model that adds the cost of digital course content into student tuition and fees. So that's the basic definition. What is inclusiveaccess.org? We are a community-driven initiative uh, to raise awareness about the facts of automatic textbook billing, which is what we internally refer to uh, inclusive access as, in order to empower campus decision makers in selecting informed textbook affordability solutions. So I am a history major, that's my academic background, so I would be remiss if I didn't uh, start with a little bit of historical context for this conversation. So inclusive access models really started gaining traction and popularity, I would say in 2017. So they've been around since the early 10s, but they didn't start getting big until the later 10s, as evidenced by this higher ed article, and then post, well, I shouldn't say post pandemic, but um, as the pandemic has affected online education and higher ed, we've seen a more dramatic shift towards onboarding these types of programs in higher education institutions across the country. Okay, so we've done some brief definitions. I'm just gonna scooch this up so I can see you guys. Awesome, so now how does inclusive access work? There's four distilled concepts we can discuss today. One, programs usually start with an agreement between an institution, a bookstore, and publishers. Two, digital content is delivered to the students at the start of the course, typically through a learning management system. And third, students have a period to opt out before they're automatically billed for the cost. Fourth, after the course ends, students typically lose access to the content. All right. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, so that's a little overview of how inclusive access programs are similar. How do they vary? One, most campuses deploy it course by course, but we are now seeing a much larger shift to where it's employed campus-wide, like an ed tech subscription. Two, students typically are billed the cost of their specific materials, but it's much more common with that institution subscription that it's included in tuition or in fees. And third, access is mostly limited to expiring digital materials, but occasionally there are longer term access to print rentals. I have to note here, print rentals are usually an additional cost on, what, on top of whatever a student is paying to access the inclusive access program. What are some local names? Usually when an institution onboards inclusive access, they brand it. So inclusive access goes under the guise of all access, all inclusive, all students acquire, first day access, fall at access, et cetera. And as you probably recognize from that previous slide, who has a name in the game in inclusive access? Pretty much any major textbook company, um, bookstore operators have also gotten into it, as well as courseware publishers such as Red Shelf and um, Bible Source. And I'll skip this because I want to get into this. Okay, great. So there are two primary inclusive access models. These are not the official names. These are what we refer to them internally as. The first is a la carte, and that's where students are charged the cost of specific materials they have been assigned. The flat fee model, which once again is growing in popularity, is where students are charged a flat am amount based on how many units or credit hours they are taking, no matter what their specific materials cost or if some classes are leveraging OER so the materials are free. So basically what that looks like is most schools were looking at around $25 to $30 a credit hour. And if you're taking 15 units, that comes out to roughly $350 um, for that semester for your learning materials. 
So this would be an example of an inclusive access model where we're just paying for the one specific material. So all students are charged $119.98 for this chemistry textbook at the start of the course. And then this would be the flat fee model. So as you see there, it's about $25 per credit hour at Delgado Community College. Okay, so I've only got 20 minutes, so I've moved really quickly through kind of the background of inclusive access. This is the real meat of the presentation. This is where I dig into what's the deal with inclusive access programs and what should we consider before we onboard them at our campus. So a little more historical context. This is really the textbook industry's response to what they see as a growing shift to the digital space. They want to stay competitive. They still want students' business. How are they going to kind of rebrand and repackage the traditional textbook model in a way that still will capture most of the student market for course materials? So that is really the driving force behind inclusive access models from publishers. Um, I've heard it described as Netflix for books. That doesn't quite capture everything, but I think that's a pretty good overall description of what an inclusive access uh, program is. All right, so now let's talk about the myths and facts of these particular programs. So the number one claim for inclusive access programs is that they save students money. So publishers basically, through a lot of open advocacy actually, have had to really contend with this course ability, the course affordability discourse that's been going on for the past 15, 20 years. Um, so that's their response to this is, hey, we're going to offer you the subscription. It's going to be cheaper to access your textbooks. We're addressing that content affordability question that's been raised in higher ed by advocates. Our question is, are the savings actually significant? So I think it's really important to discuss how these industries are calculating that cost savings. So when they say that it's less than a traditional textbook, the first thing that we have to understand is that when they say less, they mean less than the cost of a brand new edition of that textbook shrink wrapped from the actual publisher site. So they're not, it's not an aggregate amount they're, they're, they're getting from like used books, e-versions, print versions, and then they're kind of creating an average price and making it lower than that. It just has to be lower than that sticker price. So already a pretty high, high price point um, for most textbook companies, their, their sticker price is, is quite high. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning here, I'm just wanting this graph, kind of this conversation about college textbooks and inflation. So as you can see from this graph, college textbooks have outpaced inflation for the past 15 years or so. And there's a very specific reason for this. It's because every time textbook companies saw dips in their profit margins, they would artificially increase the price of their textbooks. So what we have here is called a principal agent problem because textbook companies sell to the principal faculty, but the faculty isn't responsible for the cost burden that's passed to students, textbook in the textbook industry kind of exploited that gap. And they realized that anytime they experienced profit dips, they could just ratchet artificially, ratchet up the price of their textbooks. Um, the CEO, previous CEO of Cengage is actually on the record saying that that is a well-known practice in the textbook publishing industry to have this artificial price lever to offset profit loss. Um, when we deal with corporations, a lot of my work has been um, uh, in the corporate space in terms of kind of holding higher ed corporations to task kind of and making sure that the claims they're making in the ed tech and publishing space are accurate. Something that we do a lot is we look at past practices to predict future trends. So our concern is that just like they've artificially ratcheted up the price of textbooks in the last two decades, they could do the same thing with inclusive access models. So even though now it's a little bit cheaper for students, sometimes our fear is that they could artificially increase that flat fee, for example. There's nothing in the contract currently for these inclusive access models that would prevent them from doing that. All they're required to do is give the school notice. They're not required to put a price cap. So today it could be 25 per credit hour, next year 30, next year 35, 40, 50, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, looking at past practices to predict future trends, we have um, just some questions about how they're going to be able to maintain these cost savings to students uh, in the next several decades as these models become more popular. All right, the second biggest claim to fame of inclusive access programs is that uh, this kind of first day content delivery for students. So we know that with the traditional textbook model, students are getting their textbooks at all different points in the semester, right? They're getting them two weeks in, some have them the first day, some never get them. So the idea here is that inclusive access models provide everyone a digital copy of the content the first day of class. So in one sense, that is convenient. But in the other sense, our question is, does that constrict students as consumers? 
So another graph here, this is trends in student spending on textbooks in the past five or so years, seven years now. You'll notice that from 2016 on, there's a decline in textbook spending. That actually does not mean that students were getting less textbooks. What it actually means is that students were going to alternative methods to get their textbooks. So they were going to Chegg, they were going to Amazon, they were pirating their textbooks. And this drove costs down quite a bit because students were getting creative to kind of combat these high content costs. You will notice, however, that right around the start of the pandemic, there's an uptick again. There's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that there was just reduced access to lower cost materials because of supply chain issues during the pandemic. But the other reason is because the textbook industry, did they implemented an artificial price increase to offset some of their profit loss from the pandemic. So once again, past practices to predict future trends. We have some questions uh, revolving around how these companies and corporations and the industry has acted in the past. And we don't want that to be replicated with inclusive access programs. Right, we spent a lot of time talking about students. What about faculty? There are other groups that can be impacted by the decision to onboard an inclusive access program. So we have reason to believe that there is an opportunity here for these programs to limit faculty freedom of choice and also their academic freedom. So because these are subscription models, they operate kind of a unique space in uh, purchasing. And what I mean by that is they're treated like a piece of ed tech instead of course materials because of the way you have to onboard the subscription. Generally, subscriptions fall under the purview of administration. Um, I formerly, before I was an instructor technologist and designer, was just an ed tech specialist, and I was responsible for acquiring and maintaining and doing all the purchase orders for our big ed tech subscriptions. And I work primarily with administrators because that makes sense. That's who onboards a subscription. So we're kind of in this gray area because it's course materials, but it's being implemented like a subscription, which means that the decision to implement these programs is largely being made by administrators. I believe most administrators are acting in good faith. They've, they've heard a lot about you know, course content affordability. They wanna make things better. The industry is telling them that this is a solution. And so they're kind of running with it. We would like to see more faculty and student input made in these decisions, because even though it's onboarded like an ed tech subscription, it still is course content, which is under the purview of faculty. All right, we've talked a whole lot about how this affects students. We've touched a little on how it affects faculty. This is kind of um, really the wide scope one that I like to end on, and it has to do, I think, with all aspects of the college, students, faculty, and everything else, which is, is this a deal or is it data mining? So we're no strangers in the 21st century in 2022 to large, very reputable, reputable even tech companies being subjected to data breaches. That is absolutely a concern with inclusive access programs. Inclusive access uh, programs can and do collect a lot of student data. Um, and there have been instances of some of these programs farming that data out to third parties. So we, you know, any institution that's that's interested maybe in onboarding one of these programs, we really recommend you look at the contract language. Um, there is definitely concern. There's always the potential for data breach, but we're also just concerned with what's happening to all the student data once it is acquired by the publishing company. Um, so that's kind of like the the, the large general concern. Um, the other concern has to do a little bit more with transparency. So these programs deploy reading analytics, and that tracks how often the student opens the textbook, how long they stay on a particular page, as long as a, a slew of other um, information from the learning management system. And this poll was done by student purgs in 2020. Basically, it's on a scale of one to 10, one being a poor understanding of how publisher data is collected and what it's used for, and 10 being a perfect understanding of how publishers collect your data when you use an ebook and what they're doing with it, most students score about a two, which is not, which is not fabulous. It's never good to have students utilizing um, a piece of material or ed tech that's collecting their data and they don't really understand how or why. Um, so we really encourage transparency in this model. If you are going to onboard an inclusive access program, you know, please be very transparent with students because all they're going to get from the publisher is that tiny little button that says, do you agree? And once they hit that agree, you know, the first pop up when they first open their book, that's it. That's all the publisher has to provide in terms of, you know, information to this student. So really being transparent with students about what's being collected when they use one of these programs 
um, because the publishers aren't going to be as transparent as possible. Okay, really quick. So this is a short session. I've tried to pack a lot of information. How to navigate inclusive access if you're considering one of these programs for your campus. First of all, this is the Open Ed Conference. We have our uh, OER and inclusive access comparison cheat sheet. I won't dig too much into it, but as you can kind of see from the stuff up here, OER is obviously a much more open and equitable option. It's not a stopgap solution. OER is not a silver bullet, but I think it's worth seeing a compare and contrast of these two side by side. Um, inclusive access, this is kind of my main tagline for this. I think it's an integration versus dissemination issue. Inclusive access, it's great that it's ebook, it's great that it's digital, but that's just a different method of dissemination. It doesn't have the integration power that OER has to be adapted for local context. What can you do? It all comes down to the contracts. Be proactive, ask questions, be rigorous, and center equity. Um, these are companies. They'll tell you there's things in the contract they can't change. They're not being upfront. They absolutely can make concessions in the contract. So make sure that the data is not being farmed out. Make sure that there's security protections for your students. You can definitely bring them to the table if you're considering one of these programs. We offer a ton of resources on our site. We have uh, the fact sheets for various stakeholder groups, the myths versus facts. We have PDFs of all those slides I just briefly went through that kind of spells it out at more length. Common questions you can ask. We also have a Spark contract library. We've collected uh, contracts from over 150 schools across the country that are currently using inclusive access programs. And we've made those contracts available to you so that you can kind of scan them, see what kind of deals other schools are getting, see how they're setting up security stuff. And we can also work with you to help you if you're considering onboarding one of these programs. Finally, students cannot learn from books they can't afford. So even if inclusive access programs are making kind of claims about affordability, it's important to understand that, you know, the bottom line of affordability is can students actually opt in? Can they afford it? Um, and is it a transparent model? And that's what we'd like to center on. So our logo says it all. We are inclusiveaccess.org. All the information I said today can be found by simply typing that into URL bar. Um, and that about sums it up. As my grandma would say, there you go and there you have it. So I've run through that very, very quickly. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Once again, we are inclusiveaccess.org. We are an initiative to raise awareness about, we, about what we believe could be, you know, potential pitfalls of publisher inclusive access programs. We wanna make sure our students are getting the best and most equitable options for their course content. There was a question early on from Lori Coleman. Does House Bill 1027 require institutions to notify students they can opt out and how to opt out? I have never seen this information at my institution. Our bookstore is Barnes and Noble. Yes, so that is, let me see, I'm just scanning this. Yes, there. Texas has done some incredible stuff with transparency legislation, really just phenomenal. So yes, there are requirements, um, implementate, you know, requirements and then implementation can be, can be a different thing, but just knowing that that is a requirement is very helpful. Um, Barnes and Noble specifically, I work at Barnes and Noble campus, if you call them, they will work with you, but you're going to have to initiate the conversation because, as I've said, implementation of a requirement, um, usually there's a bit of a stopgap there. But it, they're absolutely willing to work with you if you bring them to task. Uh, and I believe that they have software now that makes it a little bit easier to be transparent. Um, but definitely reach out to your local Barnes & Noble representative. Um, uh, I'm seeing here House Bill 1027 requires institutions to notify students they can opt out. I was this mission. Oh yeah, okay, got it. Awesome. Oh yeah, opt out. That's one more thing. I'm seeing a lot of things in here about opt out. Um, I didn't have time to go into it, but that is something I'm very passionate about in these models. You most of them are opt out, so the student is just going to be automatically enrolled um, unless they take steps to remove themselves from the program, which means that they're going to be automatically billed for that content. Um, being really transparent if you do onboard about your opt out process, making it really easy for students to access. Uh, most students do not like to be automatically billed for things. Um, so just, yeah, being super transparent. We also have my, some ideas on our website of how you can go about that process. Uh, do you see any movement to get some regulation around data use on these distribution models? Yes, but it's very slow. Uh, usually tech companies are very nimble and the government is a little bit slower. So it, it takes some time to get regulation around this. Um, we are working on creating a transparent privacy policy um, 
uh, kind of research project right now. So hopefully that'll be up and running in next semester and we can offer you guys some more information. Thanks guys for your time. I appreciate it very, very much. Great, and uh, it looks like everything's working on Arturo's end. Do you want to check your mic really quick? We'll start your presentation in five minutes. Yeah, I'm talking now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sounds great. All right, excellent. Okay, uh, so we will wait until 2.25 to begin. Um, Trudy, if you want to hang around and keep answering questions in the chat, if you'd like, um, that's fine. Sure, absolutely. I will hang out for another five minutes. All right, we're getting ready to start up again in a moment. Um, please remember to mute your microphones and turn off your video feed uh, so that we can save bandwidth for the presenters. And I will keep an eye for questions in chat. Our next presentation is Too Legit to Quit, Five Recommendations for Creating Sustainable Institutional Level OER Programs. So go ahead and take it away, Arturo. Thank you, Justin. Um, hello, my name is uh, Arturo Osuna, and I am an e-learning instructional designer for Tarrant County College Connect Campus. And um, one of the roles that I have on my campus is uh, currently leading our efforts to establish an OER textbook development program. Uh, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, research that I conducted. This was research that I conducted uh, as part of my uh, dissertation, my doctoral dissertation from Southern Methodist University, I uh, conducted a study that explored um, 
the role of institutional dynamics and intrinsic factors uh, that impacted uh, faculty members' decisions to uh, engage in OER development. And I really wanted to understand um, this phenomenon in order to better understand how institutions can better uh, sustain uh, OER development at the institution level. So um, my uh, study was guided by two main research questions. And, and as I mentioned, uh, one, one was very institution focused and the other was very um, intrinsic focused. And the way I essentially operationalized um, th uh, these concepts um, from the institutional side, I really looked at uh, this, this idea and this concept of legitimacy, right? Legitimacy as the primary driver for uh, institutional behavior. And, and more specifically than that, I looked at um, um, this phenomenon through the, through the lens of uh, what are called institutional logics. And essentially those are just groupings of legitimized behaviors. And the way I looked at um, intrinsic factors were through a self-determination theory. And essentially I, I used um, this idea of professional identity to sort of um, uh, serve as a, a conceptual bridge, so to speak, to, 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 uh, to help provide an understanding of, of how one impacts the other and the other uh, impacts uh, the other. So I wanna talk a little bit about some, <clears throat> some broad findings, um, some things that were um, you know, expected and, and then maybe some things that, that weren't expected. Um, for the for you know for uh, many of of of, of the uh, studies participants, uh, benefits and incentives really aligned with the literature on on the benefits and and incentives tied to these types of programs, right? Uh, benefits around uh, student affordability, benefits around um, you know uh, student success, uh, particularly with uh, populations of low socioeconomic uh, status students, um, such as uh, is prevalent at, at the site that um, that I studied. Um, there were there were a lot of incentives that were that, that were flexibility of the materials, you know, that that faculty. So so these were aligned a lot with the literature. But what I found um, really by exploring some of the the personal motivators were that there there were some nuanced understandings of, of some of these benefits, things that that didn't necessarily come up in in the literature. Um, you know, uh, certainly there, for instance, uh, there's flexibility around uh, a lot of reported flexibility around the material. But um, some some of some of the participants that I talked to really really enjoyed the flexibility around the publishing model, right? And so that's not something that I had seen or heard about. So, so those were kinds of, uh, that's an example of the kinds of nuances that, uh, that came out of, of the study. Um, the other thing that became really clear is that, is that um, this sort of multi-layered institutional support and, and advocacy really had a positive impact um, of, and, and was really vital to the sustainability of the program at the institution that I studied, right? And and what I mean by multi leveled is that th there were there was you know some sense of advocacy or support or um, championing at the leadership level. There was some um, there was some centralized structure, and and then there was some uh, departmental level support. And that sort of goes. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in, in, in my recommendations, but essentially the, this multi-leveled uh, advocacy leadership and infrastructure was, was really vital to, to the sustainability of this work at the institution. Um, you know, I, I know for, for those of you who, who have attended earlier sessions, um, you know, you've heard a lot about sort of the, the, what I'm calling like the tenure dilemma, right? Uh, there was a lot of, there, there, was, there was these uh, tensions and um, kind of unresolved tensions and and competing priorities when it came to uh, OER and and one of the examples that that kept coming up was 
um, you know, how OER counts towards tenure and promotion. And, and this led to uh, sort of marginalization of, of tenure track faculty that, you know, at this institution really uh, tenure track faculty were discouraged, actively discouraged um, from uh, participating in, in OER development. And so the, the, the brunt of the OER work at the campus was done uh, by you know either fully tenured faculty or, or non tenured faculty, and so you know I know that there there's there's work sort of to to talk about this and address this, but certainly this came out in in, in my study, and then um, and then the added piece of you know personal motivations right there there were these what I found is that there were all these different reasons why uh, you know faculty decided to engage in this work and really. Ultimately, OER served as a, a way for faculty to promote personal philosophies, to promote the values that they cared about or that that their uh, that their discipline cared about, or or even in some cases personal agendas like like passion projects, so, so to speak. So those were those were big uh, broad findings. The other thing that sort of came out of the study is sort of the, the beginnings of, of, a, of what I guess I'm calling a conceptual model. And essentially what, what, what I identified through uh, the study, and, and this was a synthesis of some of the literature on, on, on OER sustainability, some of the work of, of folks like uh, Pawski and Bick, uh, Weller and Wiley and, and others. Um, but essentially, um, I sort of started thinking about OER sustainability in, in, in sort of these four key areas, right? Uh, technology, which include things like uh, platforms and, and, and decisions around platforms and software, uh, financial, and that's obviously like funding sources, uh, institutional investments, but also decisions about where, where that funding comes from and, and, and where it lies and, and how it's distributed and, and in what form. Um, and then there, there's a uh, structural, um, which is things like support systems, policies, uh, infrastructure just to support this work. And then there's, there's also these, sort of these, this cultural thing that's it's, it's huge, right? And it, this is thing, th these are things like language, um, the, you know, how, how is the institution talk about OER? You know, what, what does the communication look like and where is it coming from? Uh, what does outreach look like, um, and 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 how uh, in depth it is, and then and then what are the perceptions around this work, right? Uh, particularly OER development, right? In in this case, so the the way I, I I sort of want to describe this model is that there 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 are legitimized behaviors that are tied to each area, and uh, these these can either create a barrier for um, for this work. Or in some cases, um, they can they can create uh, uh, or lend their legitimacy to other areas that impact other areas. And and I can give you kind of an example of this, right? So uh, I talked earlier about the the tenure dilemma, right? And and for me, like the tenure dilemma is a product of a structural policy, right? So it's it's this thing that lives in in the structural area of this model, and and what it does is it creates a barrier, right, for the cultural area. Right, so uh, essentially, um, uh, it creates a barrier for buy-in, and, and in some cases, a, a really, a really, um, you know, destructive barrier, depending on on uh, on how that uh, policy is is written. Um, but <clears throat> at the same time, there are sometimes decisions in in the in the structural area, like for instance, the decision at this institution. Um, where they stated very explicitly that funding was coming out of the president's office, right? And so that created, and, and, and that sort of leveraged this, this structural legitimacy to impact the cultural area in, in a positive way, right? Because faculty then saw that that supported at the leadership level. And so as you can see that where uh, a lot of structural decisions um, lead to, to, to either barriers in, 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 in some of these other areas and, and so when you when when you think about this model, I want you to think about it from the standpoint of of uh, within your own institutions. What are the forces that are create that are uh, creating challenges in one area, and how can you uh, potentially leverage legitimacy in that area 
to support um, buy-in and legitimacy in another, right? So <clears throat> I want to talk now about the um, the recommendations and uh, uh, you know essentially what what this model sort of helped me uh, uh, come to the conclusion of is that OER leadership must really be strategic in uh, in tailoring the structure, uh, the outreach, you know, communication and language around OER. And, and, and then the, the assessment, and what I mean by that is sort of the evidence of impact based on their institution's values and their institution's priorities, right? Uh, at the end of the day, what, what the study really told me is that institutional context really matters, right? And there are the, all these financial decisions and structure that's existent and culture that's existent and, you know, historical context. And, and um, when, when an institution is really looking at how do we sustain this work, um, it really need to, really needs to ask itself what are the values and the priorities that are already legitimized behaviors of the institution, and how can we take advantage of that as as OER uh, advocates and OER workers, and and um, it you know when it works really well, these values and priorities are are a reflection of student needs, for instance, and so. Um, you know, OER at, at its essence is about, uh, it, you know, uh, addressing student needs in, in some way. So, so, um, so that's the first recommendation. I, uh, the second re recommendation is that OER leadership should engage in a holistic approach to support these efforts that include funding, uh, outreach, advocacy, at multiple levels. And so when, when you're thinking about the model, this is really a structural component that, that is uh, meant to impact the cultural. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of how this could work. At, at the institution that, uh, that I studied, it's an R1 institution. And so they very astutely um, called the funding uh, grants. Right, and that was very meaningful in an R1. And, and even if they weren't grants that sort of uh, helped promote the uh, or or counted towards R1 status, the fact that they were called grants lended legitimacy to the grant program and to the OER development program. And so it's these kinds of sort of small decisions around language that really have uh, lasting impacts in. How this work is supported and the, the 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 legitimacy around this work, and and so it's it's those it's that kind of thing. And, and as I mentioned, also it's that holistic approach. It's that that top level, uh, centralized level, and and then departmental level. And I can't I can't say enough about that that aspect of it. And and that's why it's sort of by itself a, the third recommendation. I think departmental level buy-in is really vital to sustainability at the institution levels, right? So uh, in some cases, these are support roles. Uh, at this institution, they were uh, in the form of liaison librarians that were already, that already had built trust at the departmental level, that already had, that were legitimized roles in that uh, function. And, and the way it turned out was that uh, the liaison librarians that really advocated and pushed for OER those are the departments that really flourished uh, in, in uh, OER and really bought into OER as a concept. And the departments where the liaison librarians were, were less um, advocates of OER, the, that the work um, was not as successful or the experience of, of faculty in those departments were not as positive as, as those um, with, that had that departmental level buy-in. Um, I think this goes, uh, this is sort of a common theme, this, this fourth recommendation, which is essentially that institutions really have to work to address sort of those competing priorities and those tensions that, that are created. Uh, you know, at, at the institution in which I studied, it was the tenure dilemma, but, but at many institutions, it's this idea of commercial textbook pra practices and uh, that work in opposition to these efforts. And, and that's a structural thing, right? And then uh, last but not least, I think, uh, what uh, the identification around uh, personal motivations is that institutions should really be talking about the benefits of OER uh, differently to faculty 
potentially than they are to students or other stakeholders, right? Because um, I think there are things that faculty are motivated by that, that um, you know, that are beyond just what you would expect, right? Like the funding and things of that nature. And, and as I, you know, I, I remember speaking to one faculty member and, and as they, they talked about all the benefits that, you know, they started to say, oh, we are began to check off a lot of boxes for me, right? And so I think it's the idea of, of what are the other boxes that you can check off for faculty as, as, as you try to, to sustain this work moving forward. So um, one of the things I wanna share is a handout. Um, I have a link to it and I'll just pop it right in. And these are just some, some sort of concepts around the, the conceptual model and some questions that uh, you, 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 know, you might uh, wanna ask as you um, think about sustainability of OER development at, at the institution level. And I'll leave uh, the rest of the time for questions. Great, we have uh, four minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to throw them in the chat. Oh, and I, I do wanna say one thing is, uh, I do wanna write uh, a more sort of uh, comprehensive um, paper on the, that model. And so if you're doing similar work, I'd, I'd be happy to team up with you and, 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 uh, and explore that as, as, a, as a next step for uh, the conceptual model, so certainly reach out to me uh, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, I see a question here. Did you find that faculty-led OER initiatives were more successful than library-led initiatives? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I think the work was done in different ways, right? There were some instances where for a department, uh, it really took um, sort of the liaison librarian role to really push and 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 really like in some cases they were they were co-authors and they were doing a lot of the, sort of the leg work right and then and in other in other uh, departments um, the work was more of a collaborative process or more of a of a sort of a strategic um, role where. Uh, for instance, a chair would would try to build collegiality by getting faculty together and and um, you know to 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 write a, a resource uh, or something like that. So I don't know that one was more successful than the other. I just think that 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 work sort of buy in happened in those in those cases in different ways. But certainly the departmental level buy in was was hugely important in, in both cases. Um, Rebecca, to your question about would I advocate for a joint top-down or bottom-up approach uh, with executive leadership support? I, honestly, what I would advocate is whatever works for your institution, right? Um, in some institutions, that's that's going to work really great. Uh, and and, it, and uh, at this institution, it it just happened that that the 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 funding coming from the president's office, right, coming from that senior leadership really sent a message about the importance of, you know, there wasn't a lot of advocacy specifically from the president's office. A lot of that came from a centralized structure that, that, that worked through the library. But, but I, I do think that it has to be holistic, right? There, have, there has to be some multi-level, whether, whether that communication is exclusively coming from the president's office, and then a lot of sort of the, the the on the ground support is happening in the library or in the center for teaching and learning. Or I think you borrow the legitimacy of those of of the existing structures, certainly, right? So if, if you have a really popular center for teaching and learning, then then you leverage that, right? 
and, and maybe it makes sense there more than it makes sense uh, establishing something from new. So I think it's sort of thinking through what do we have and what where can we borrow uh, you know trust and legitimacy and, and social capital to to sort of make this work for us in a way that um, that may be different from what another institution is doing. All right, thanks so much, Arturo. The Absolutely. next- thank you. Yeah, um, please feel free to hang around and chat and answer any questions. Uh, the next group, we wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen to make sure everything's working all right. Yeah. Looks good. Okay, so also what I'll do is uh, we will wait until 2.50 to get started. Uh, when you have five minutes left, I'll play the sound effect. And that will let you know that you are now into your Q&A time. Uh, hopefully I can do that without interrupting you. So we'll wait out the next few minutes for people who are coming in from other sections and then I'll do a brief introduction and we'll get going again. Okay, hi everyone again. I am the moderator of this session. My name is Justin White. Uh, please keep your videos and microphones muted unless you have a question during the Q&A portion of each presentation. This session is being live captioned. Unfortunately, they are not appearing in Zoom, so I will post a link to an external site where the captions can be viewed, uh, along with the code of conduct and IT support email right here. And now our next presentation, analyzing OER gaps across Texas regions to advance statewide OER supports. Take it away. Thanks, Justin. Everybody can hear me okay? Uh, it's one of those days when I've been having internet issues, you know, it, of course it happens today, but 
Um, so I am Kyla Torrey. I'm the Director of Digital Learning at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Um, and I'm joined by my colleagues at ISCME, Anastasia Caraglani and Selena Burns. And we're gonna talk to you a little bit about the Texas uh, Regional OER Needs Analysis that we've been working on recently. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, we've been doing uh, OER landscape studies of Texas for, so we've done two now, one in 2019 and one in 2021. Um, and I actually put a link to one of those reports, the most recent report in chat earlier, but we decided that we wanted to look deeper into that information, into the data that we collected and see, you know, which regions in Texas have a greater need for OER support? Um, what are the patterns? Which, wh where are people adopting OER? Where are people not adopting OER? Um, and then we did some uh, qualitative studies too to see what the challenges were for institutions that were maybe not adopting as quickly as others. And so, um, Selena and Anastasia are going to talk to you about the findings of that regional analysis, and then I'll talk a little bit about what programs have come out of it. Thank you, Kyla. Uh, so this study had uh, two components, a quantitative and a qualitative one. For our quantitative analysis, we used the data from the 2019 and 2021 landscape surveys that uh, we had designed collaboratively uh, with uh, THCCB and uh, Digitex to capture the state of OER use in Texas. In order to identify institutions that were in the beginning of their OER journey, we used a common question in these surveys that, that asked, asked institutions to identify uh, whether they had uh, practices, programs, or initiatives that support the uh, OER. Uh, this question was selected because it consistently predicted uh, group uh, classification. And then we grouped institutions into the following three groups. The first group we called the laggards and representing 10% of the respondents across both surveys. And these uh, were institutions that do not have OER policies, programs, or initiatives. And they said that they don't plan to develop any in the near future. The second group we call the interested represented 33% of the respondents across both surveys. And these were institutions that they said they currently do not have this but they are interested in developing in the near future. And the third group, we call them the beginners, represented 17% of the respondents across both surveys. And these are institutions that uh, are in the process of creating OER policies, programs, or initiatives. After the three subgroups were formed, each subgroup's responses to other survey questions were analyzed and common patterns in their practices, challenges, and needs as a group were identified. In this uh, slide, we compare the three subgroups across five dimensions that previous research on OER has shown that they are good indicators of advanced OER commitment as you can see, more advanced institutions were more likely to have a centralized office, committee, or role overseeing OER, were more likely to have trained as at least a small percentage of their faculty in OER, were more likely to have been involved in collaborations with other institutions, to have allocated funding, and to offer stipends to their faculty as incentives for creating, adopting OER. In terms of challenges and needs, all groups indicated that they need access to OER 
for specific disciplines, levels, or types of teaching materials. The laggards and the interested indicated that they struggle to ensure high quality OER and that they need funding to support the OER work. The interested and beginners were more likely to indicate a need for dedicated OER personnel and professional learning. Since the beginners were more likely to offer incentives for OER adoption and creation, it was not surprising that they were also more likely to indicate a need for stipends for this purpose. At the next step, we map the institutions comprising the three subgroups by geolocation and by level of OER commitment, trying to understand which specific regions of the state have greater need for OER support. By looking at uh, column four, the one highlighted in uh, red color, we can see that the High Plains region has the highest percentage of institutions with low OER commitment, followed by the region of Southeast. However, the regions of Metroplex, Gulf Coast, and South Tex have the highest overall count of institutions with low OER commitment. As part of the study, we also identified and mapped the institutions that did not respond to either the 2019 or the 2021 OER landscape survey. 40 institutions out of the 169 that were invited to participate in the surveys did not respond. This represents 24% of all post-secondary institutions. And as you can see from the pie chart here, the 60% of the non-responding institutions were private institutions. And my colleague Selena will continue uh, with the qualitative part of the study. We followed up the quantitative analysis with qualitative interviews with five different institutions in five different regions in Texas. These were all two-year public colleges or systems. This had to do in part with the fact that they made up the majority of these uh, low OER implementation institutions, and it also related to who agreed to do an interview with us. We typically interviewed someone at the level of the Dean of Academic Affairs or a similar position. They often brought in other OER advocates and leaders to speak with us at the interview. In one case, we spoke to a librarian. Next slide. So in the interviews, we attempted to see what the landscape of OER was at these different institutions and nine different themes emerged from the interview data. The first of which is that similarly across all of the institutions, the reason for OER adoption had to do with wanting to reduce textbook costs for students. But there was also um, a, a very deep interest in how that related to equity and student success. If you saw in the previous slide, the institutions that we were interviewing had a large number of students with financial need had, they had a large number of first generation students uh, that almost four out of five of them were Hispanic serving institutions. There was definitely a recognition that faculty had an interest in creating culturally relevant course materials, but these institutions weren't at a place yet where they had institutional support for how to do that with OER. At all of the institutions that we talked to, there was a lot of academic freedom. These were institutions where the faculty typically got to create their own syllabus and choose their own course materials. And there was also a lot of uh, campus uh, academic freedom and, and campus freedom at multi-campus institutions. So the need for buy-in was critical, the need for ground up buy-in from faculty, and then also at individual campuses at multi-campus institutions. We had a quote, there's an understanding that to attempt to try something top down is probably a good way to cause it not to happen. I think probably all of the institutions that we interviewed related to that quote. Next slide. 
So funding helps OER advancement. We certainly, four out of the five institutions that we interviewed were at the beginner level. So they were, they were more advanced than some of the, the laggard or the interested institutions. And it was very clear that funding made a big difference, but a lot of the funding that they saw as available was for OER creation. And there was a need for funding for other things, such as professional development that would help with faculty buy-in. Um, inadequate time and staffing were barriers to OER advancement. In some of the institutions we interviewed, they were in locations that were more remote. Their, their schools were more under-resourced. And so while we saw at some institutions that the pandemic really pushed schools toward OER, at other institutions, because OER is so dependent on, on faculty and librarians and other staff and administrator donating their time, um, the pandemic was really a, a barrier because faculty were busy and there was a lot of turnover. Internal collaborator, collaborators and champions help OER advancement, as you've probably seen in, in other research. Um, institutions were able to move forward with OER when they were able to create these cross-campus collaborations. Administration could be a very powerful supports, including in finding uh, funding for OER internally, but also collaborations with student success offices, collaborations with bookstores and registrars to, to help with course marking. The more collaborations, the better. Next slide. External mentoring and cross-institutional partnerships. Institutions were, were helped when they were able to network with nearby institutions that were similar to them who were doing similar OER work. We talked to one institution that was able to forge a partnership with a nearby institution that was a little farther along with their OER. So they were able to use them as a model and also collaborate with them on a grant application. There are barriers to OER for CTE courses. As you saw in the quantitative data, a lot of the concern from these low, low OER implementation institutions was the lack of resources available and concerns about quality. And we saw that that really especially was true for CTE courses because CTE courses involved accrediting agencies, involved testing. There was a great concern that these texts in particular have to be up to date. They have to be accurate. They, um, the people wanted to know that they had been successfully used and the students had gone on to pass these tests. And then finally, the online th format of OER requires additional um, support structures to ensure equity and accessibility. Again, the pandemic really showed that if you want students to be accessing resources online, you need to make sure that they have the digital infrastructure to do that because many students don't have access to, um, to reliable high-speed internet at home or their only device is their little phone, which isn't the best for OER. Next slide. So what are the findings that we found across both the quantitative and the qualitative data? First of all, we saw that support is needed across all regions. We didn't see that there were some regions where almost all the institutions were advanced in their OER implementation and other regions where none were advanced. There was really a mix in, in every region, but also in every region, there were more institutions that were at this laggard interested beginner level than there were institutions that were at the advanced level. At the same time, there was at least one institution in every region that was advanced. So there is the possibility to build these mentoring relationships and, and networking opportunities on a regional level. And then we saw that um, many of these low OER implementation institutions had similar challenges and needs, faculty awareness and buy-in, but also the need for awareness and buy-in for other collaborators, professional development and training, which is needed for that buy-in in addition to the adoption and creation training. OER in certain disciplines like CTE or at certain levels, OER quality assurance and that relates to buy-in dedicated staff funding, and again, funding not just for OER creation, but for this infrastructure support and for professional development and uh, administrative support. And Kyla is going to tell you what the coordinating board has or is going to have to help address these challenges and needs. Thanks, Selena. 
So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. Oh, five minutes left. I'll talk fast about what we're doing and what we're planning on doing in the future. But it's, it's really the idea is to take this research and turn it into action, to turn it into supports and programs and, and, and ways to, to move OER along in Texas. Um, so one of the recommendations was, of course, professional learning opportunities. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and at the coordinating board, in partnership with ISME, we've offered a number of professional learning opportunities over the past uh, couple of years now. Um, some core elements academies, which are foundational academies for OER, uh, advanced skills academies, and a creator communities academy that uh, is was really focused on the creation of OER in, in teams. Um, we did Creator Fest OER Texas edition in partnership with OpenStax in February uh, that was focused on creation and peer review of OER. Um, so trying to offer supports and places where, like Open Texas, people can get together, form connections, talk about OER and learn more about what it means to uh, either create, use, adopt, move OER along at their institutions. Uh, next slide, please. We're, we're also in the process with ISME of creating the Texas OER Playbook, which is uh, a text that's designed to support institutions in building capacity and driving systems change around OER. So the idea would be, it would be an openly licensed uh, resource that could be available freely on OER Texas for all institutions to take, learn uh, about what other great institutions are doing in Texas as far as OER goes, how they got there, um, and the steps towards sort of either building or scaling OER programs on campus. Um, we've created this resource or in the process of creating this resource um, with input and peer review by members of the Texas OER community. Um, we had an advisory committee and we have currently peer reviewers looking at the resource uh, to, to give us some feedback on that. And so it should be coming and available in OER Texas in fall, winter of 2022, so later this year. We talked a little bit about um, one of the findings was the importance of, of CTE OER. And one of our projects is the OER Nursing Essentials Project. Um, nursing is of course a, a high need field. Um, and we're in the, we did a discovery phase in partnership with OpenStax to look into the feasibility of designing and developing OER for nursing, uh, specifically based on the new essentials curriculum that came from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing recently. Um, we're currently contracted with OpenStax to do a planning phase of the project, sort of scoping out what that would look like, talking to nursing faculty, talking to nursing administrators, and, and um, getting an idea of, of what would what OER is already out there, because a lot of states have created some wonderful OER around nursing already. Um, and we did a request for proposals recently for the implementation phase, which would actually be involving creating that OER. Uh, that closed recently. And so uh, we'll be hopefully <laughs> contracting for the implementation phase coming soon. And then, and then we'll um, move along with that project. And lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about, of course, there is already in existence the OER Texas repository, um, which is now two years old as of September, and so which is this month. And so we are celebrating it next week, September 26th through 30th, um, with a series of workshops in partnership with ISME um, to talk about how do you use the OER Texas repository? How do you use the tools there? Um, to How do you collaborate with other faculty members? That sort of thing. So please join us in, at OER Texas Celebration Week next week. Um, and you can find more information about it by going to the uh, digital learning group, and we can go to the next slide. Um, either the THUCB digital learning news and events group, which is on OER Texas, feel free to join that. Or uh, you can go to our Gov delivery site, which and click the little box that says you're interested in digital learning updates, and then you will receive the updates related to digital learning that we send out to institutions. Um, and I can put that link in the chat as well. Um, Okay, I talked fast. <laughs> Great, Everybody's thanks so much. <laughs>
um, if you could stop sharing and um, so Stephanie Savage can try sharing their slides just to make sure that we're ready for the next session, which will begin at 3.15. So feel free to take a break, stretch your legs, uh, do all essential biological functions, whatever you need. Hey there, I just wanna make sure you can hear me. Yes. Okay, let me share my screen. Is that looking like a full screen presentation? Looks right. Okay, awesome. Um, and of course, you know, we do have a couple minutes in between. So if you have any questions for the previous presenters, feel free to keep putting them in chat and um, previous presenters feel free to answer in chat. Otherwise, take a break. Oh, and Stephanie, when you have five minutes left, I will play the sound effect. So hopefully it won't uh, interrupt you too much. Okay, sounds good. All right, everybody, let's get ready to start going again. I am your moderator. My name is Justin White. Please keep your videos and microphones muted unless you have a question during the Q&A portion of each presentation. This session is being live captioned. Uh, unfortunately, they are not appearing in Zoom, so I will post a link to an external site where the captions can be viewed. I'm also going to post a link to the code of conduct and the IT support email. And our next presentation is Down the Copyright Rabbit Hole, The Unexpected Labor of Copyright Clearance in OER Projects. Feel free to take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. 
Um, yes, this is my presentation on copyright clearance in OER production. Not the most perhaps exciting part of OER production, but a very important one nonetheless. Um, I think I put a link into the chat with my slides. So I try to be a good OER creator and um, share my slides and they're all licensed to CC license for reuse. So I won't spend too much time talking about myself, but I just want to say um, this is my context. I'm a scholarly communications and copyright services librarian, and I work at the University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver, Canada. So that is important for a couple of reasons, primarily because my context is in Canadian copyright law. My expertise is in Canadian copyright law and sort of my higher ed context is the, the Canadian one. I think that this presentation and the comments I have about copyright are broad enough to apply both in an American context and a Canadian context. And I did try to sort of Americanize this a bit, talk about things like fair use instead of fair dealing. Um, but I just wanted to add that caveat there that some of the, the context for the legal references I make will be the Canadian references, although most of the principles are sort of applicable either way. So before I talk about this scenario, I just want to say a few things about why I think unexpected copyright labor is so sort of common in OER production. And one of the reasons why I think that is, is because a lot of first time OER creators are people who are taking or instructors who are taking resources that they've already created for teaching in their courses, and they want to then transfer them into open products. So they're taking something that they've used in a closed environment, and they want to make it open and accessible to a much broader audience. So that can be a different sort of set of copyright obligations. So for example, if we think of this scenario, which is a common one that I'm presented with, and this is actually from sort of um, an actual experience at my university, we have people who create sort of very rich media products. Um, in this case, I'm just gonna my video to make it go away there. Um, in this case, we have a professor who's teaching Persian language, and he created many modules that have a lot of different media content, a lot of images from across the internet. So these are not just your typical, you know, open images, but they are photographs, they are rich sort of um, culturally relevant images from across the internet, and they were maybe useful in his context in his classroom, but they're not necessarily easy to put into an open environment. So why are these copyright considerations different in an OER product? Well, I think we have different copyright obligations when we are in the open. So why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because not only are we sharing this material with students sort of for a closed dissemination, we want to make these materials available for sort of downstream use as well, right? So we have to think about sort of the ethics of downstream sharing. And we have to think about policy obligations we might have. We might have OER funder support. We might need to be paying attention to what our funders are requiring. And so we have to have sort of a higher level of copyright compliance in these environments. So that is often when I'm brought into this conversation to help with OER production. It's to consider copyright in this more delicate, more open environment. And when I am working with OER creators and authors, I tend to focus on these four key copyright considerations when we talk about copyright obligations. Um, and I also put these sort of in order of the way or the order that I would think about them. So we want to start with sort of assessing the copyrightability of that material that we're including. Then we often talk about obviously open licensing. So can we, are these materials open licensed or can we find um, alternative materials that op are openly licensed? We often talk about permissions and then also importantly copyright exceptions so what are those exceptions in the copyright act or in the code the us code that would permit us to copy without seeking permission so i'm going to spend most of my time talking about these four different considerations so first of all there is the idea of copyrightability and i sort of use this as a catch-all term to talk about the aspects of a work that we might copy and put in oer third-party material um, to sort of assess what part of that work is protected by copyright because sometimes we're copying parts of works that do not have copyright protection at all and this is probably the more nuanced part of this work and sort of where you might want to have someone with some copyright expertise to sort of guide a creator through this part of the process 
So the first thing I often think about is substantiality. So copyright can only subsist in substantial portions of works. Um, on you know that's straightforward in a sense, but there is some nuance to this conversation. So when we talk about substantiality, it's easy to think of it in the context of like a literary work, right? So of course a novel is going to be protected by copyright, but how do we think of that? protected nature of that work in terms of what we can break down the protection to. So although the 80,000 word novel is protected, we cannot sort of assign that protection to the individual letters that make up the words or the words that make up the sentences or even sort of very short um, quotations or snips of, of that novel. So for example, this is pretty common in when we wanna pull quotations from things. Typically a quotation is not a substantial portion of a work. And therefore we don't really need to worry about the copyright protection of small quotations or short quotations from works. We can include those in OER without further assessment. Now, there are also other protected elements of a work that may or may not be relevant in a conversation around copyrightability. So really common copyright idea is this idea of the idea expression dichotomy. So from a copyright perspective, ideas are not generally understood to be protected by copyright. It's only the expression of those ideas that are protected. This is perhaps different from what faculty or instructors are used to thinking of because they um, come from an academic integrity perspective where you definitely think about ideas as belonging to people and you want to attribute people's ideas. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't paraphrase or summarize someone else's ideas and put that into an OER and have to worry about copyright. In those contexts, we typically don't have to worry about seeking for permission. Also, things like factual information or raw data are not really protected by copyright. No one can own, you know, E equals MC squared. No one can own the idea of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So those are pieces of factual information that sort of exist outside of copyright protection, it wouldn't make sense for us to assign or extend protection to these types of information, because it would limit the form of expression and it would limit innovation too much if we did that. So sometimes we can pull out the factual information underlying a work and express that in a different manner, and then we can avoid having to worry about getting copyright permission, for example, to use something. And then finally, there's often conversations around um, originality, if something has sufficient originality to, to attract copyright protection. Now, a common sort of scenario in the terms of OER creation here has to do with digital surrogates of physical materials. So for example, we may have an artwork, um, you know, a painting, and someone may digitize it and make that digital version available online. So then the question becomes, is there a copyright in that digital surrogate if there is no copyright in the underlying work itself? So people have different opinions on this. There is, I will say, there is strong case law in the States. And in the slides, in my slide notes here, I reference some cases that are applicable um, to these ideas that suggest that no, there is no new copyright protection in these digital surrogates, especially when they're just essentially what is referred to as a mechanical reproduction of an original work. So in these cases too, like if you were, you know, creating an OER on 18th century art and you're including a lot of artworks, digital representations of artworks, we don't typically need to worry about seeking permission to reuse those. But again, there is some nuance there and there is some, there are, um, you know, galleries and museums out there that, that try to assert copyright over these digital versions. And then lastly, there's always a conversation to be had about public domain particularly if we are talking about works that are older, right? So public domain here is a legal term and it references works that um, have entered the public domain after the term of copyright has expired. So in the United States, the term of copyright right now is the life of the author plus additional 70 years. After that time, a work no longer has any copyright protection, it enters the public domain and can be used for any sort of purpose. Um, so that's why we can get things like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, right? We can take Jane Austen's underlying work and we can use it in a new way. So if you happen to be creating OER and you know in history or medieval literature, these concepts are going to be really important and someone with my skill set can help you decide whether or not you need to worry about copyright um, based on a public domain analysis. 
Obviously, open license season is another big part of copyright considerations in OER production. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about open licensing. I think most people here are familiar with open licensing, and most OER creators are also familiar because they um, intend to make their work open, and they usually get to that point by having sort of become familiar with um, Creative Commons licenses and what they can facilitate. So what I will say here, though, is that some of the labor that's involved in sort of open licensing when it comes to OER, especially, like I said earlier, when we have an OER product that's sort of comes ready made, it's prepackaged, it's already been produced. Sometimes we have to go back and we have to replace some of those third party materials with openly licensed works instead when when we're using maybe potentially very like commercial works or works that are very you know protected and we want to be risk adverse, we might want to go back and reassess the works we've included and exchange them for works that are openly licensed. So in terms of the work that I do here, it is sort of um, giving consults on ways to replace copyrighted works with openly licensed works, telling people about places they can go to find openly licensed works, etc. And then another part of this too is making sure that people understand their obligations under these open licenses, what it truly means to use a work that is CC licensed, what buy means, what an attribution obligation is. For people who have worked with OER for a long time, we tend to be pretty comfortable with these licenses, but for people that are new to it, there tends to be some education required to understand the nuances of like, what is a commercial use? What is a non-commercial use? How do you do attribution? Can I put an attribution at the end of the resource or does it have to be, you know, like on my slides right beside the work that I've used? So there are some complexities there as well. Another conversation I have, if we have sort of determined that these works are protected by copyright and we cannot replace them with um, open works, is the idea of getting permission. Now, permissions is a really important part of, you know, academic use of works. And I work in a library, we are getting permissions to use works all the time in courses. But I will say that the typical sort of platforms and tools we have in place, for example, like the Copyright Clearance Center, they're not really set up to support OER creation. And that's in large part because OERs are meant to be disseminated and redisseminated and reused and lots of permission platforms require us to sort of um, put contours around how that material is going to be used or reused, which we don't, we can't really predict when it comes to OER. So although we typically can't rely on traditional tools to get permissions, sometimes if the work is unique or if it's like photographs of a colleague or lab mates materials, we can facilitate these permission requests and get um, permission to reuse material in an OER, usually by getting the original creator to assign a CC license to those works themselves. So I will also help, you know, craft these, these permission requests um, and talk about what needs to be included in them. Now, the last thing to mention here um, that's obviously really important is copyright exceptions. Now, copyright exceptions for use in OER is, I would say, not maybe controversial, but there are certainly differing opinions on whether or not it's appropriate to rely on copyright exceptions. So um, fair use obviously is the broadest exception to copyright that exists in the US code. And it is meant to facilitate a broad set of uses, including educational uses and, and, and theoretically including for use in an OER. However, there is always gonna be some risk associated with relying on an exception, in part because we don't have a black and white sort of assessment of what is fair and what's not fair. Now, one benefit of being in the States is you have very good jurisprudence around what is permitted and what fair use extends to. And there are certainly a lot of advocates of OER creation in the States who really try to encourage people to take advantage of their rights to um, rely on fair use in, in OER. So this is, I've linked to this, or I've sort of referenced this guide here, the Code of Best Practices in fair use for open educational resources. And if people aren't familiar with that, I really encourage you to take a look. This is a great document that goes through sort of common use scenarios in OER and talks about why you should rely on fair use and how you can rely on fair use for OER. And just as a bit of a side, I'll say that we are actually in the process of adapting this in the Canadian, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Canadian context. 
So Canada's a bit behind the US when it comes to rely on exceptions in, copy, uh, in OER, but we are also trying to advocate for this. <clears throat> Two last considerations I just wanna make a point of mentioning briefly are just the ideas of copyright and risk, which I've touched on a little bit, and then copyright and policy. So I will go through these sort of the, the considerations I just talked about with um, an OER creator, but there is also this broad idea of risk and how comfortable someone is with risk in, in general, especially when we are relying on things like exceptions to copyright, or also if we're relying on maybe public domain and we're not sure if something's in the public domain or not. Thank you. I, I uh, take my five minute note there. Um, and people are going to have different sort of ideas about how risky they, they want to be, how risk averse they are. So I, I have this example here of the next Rembrandt. And this is just to say too, that the law is also evolving. We don't always have strong law to tell us, to direct us on what is likely to be fair or how to address certain things. So the next Rembrandt is an example of like an AI generated image. It's, you know, researchers fed in all of Rembrandt's painting into an AI and then the AI generated this sort of the next Rembrandt, what, what could have been the next painting, right? So like, is this a copyright protected work? Who is the creator of this work? Um, can, who, if I wanted permission to use it, who would I ask? So there are a lot of complexities around things like this, around text and data mining that just copyright law hasn't caught up to. And because of that, there is more risk involved in using that type of content. Um, also, copyright and policy is another aspect of this conversation. So uh, here is an example um, I pulled from BC Campus, which is a large funder and supporter of OER production in Canada and specifically in British Columbia. They give a lot of funding to authors to create OER, and they have their own policies that sort of you really relies on their own risk tolerance. So for example, if I want to create an OER that I want to include in their um, online database, I cannot rely on copyright exceptions. I can only use openly licensed content in my OER because that's their policy. And whether or not that's, you know, the only option, it, it doesn't really matter because that's what is required by them. And if you agree to their funding regulations, then you sort of are obliged to, to um, follow their policies, right? So sometimes policy gets in the way of us doing what we want to do with our OER as well. So the last thing I'll just say here is what can we do to prepare authors when they are going to be confronted with this usually unexpected labor of copyright compliance? So here at UBC, one of the things we try to do is include copyright education in all of the sort of open um, outreach and programming that we do. So whether that's open access, OER, or just open um, education training, um, or also like open science, open research, open data, copyright is always a part of that conversation because we want researchers, students, faculty to know that um, you can't have openness without copyright protection, they're related. We also ask authors to provide an account of how they plan to address copyright issues wherever possible. So like if we are providing funding or if they're asking for our support in the library to do this, this creation, we want them to tell us what their plans are and how they plan on addressing copyright. And sometimes this opens up, it sort of reveals their lack of, of um, preparation or awareness of copyright issues. And so that can help guide the conversation. We also create a lot of training resources for OER creators. In the last slide here, um, in the notes, I linked to some of the key resources that we use here, which is just some guides on how to find open alternatives, how to deal with copyright, what Creative Commons licenses are, et cetera, that sort of thing. And then finally, we work with funders and dissemination platforms to ensure that they have clear and consistent copyright messaging and that we know what their policies and messaging is so that when we communicate with authors, we are also reflecting um, the messaging that they have so that we know if we're helping them create a resource that they want to include, for example, in that BC campus database, that I know what their obligations are and I know what policies they're gonna be expected to abide before they can submit to those places. All right, so that is the end, just under the buzzer. I will stop there um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, you still have a little bit of time, but if the next presenters want to go ahead and start sharing their screen to make sure everything works.
Is that looking good, Justin? Looks great. All right, fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. And are we waiting for Patrick LaRue? No, we're not. Okay. Just didn't want to miss anybody. Okay, so we will begin at 3.40, so feel free to take a break. Um, stretch, do all biological functions that are necessary to keep you alive and comfortable. And uh, we will get started at 3.40 on the dot. And uh, for the next presenters, what I'll do is when you have five minutes left, I'll just play the sound effect. And that'll let you know five minutes. Hopefully it's minimally uh, intrusive. Thanks for keeping us on track, Justin. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get ready to get started for our final session of the afternoon. 
Uh, hi everyone, I am Justin White. I am your moderator. Please keep your videos and microphones muted unless you have a question during the Q&A portion of the presentation. This session is being live captioned. Unfortunately, they are not appearing in Zoom, so I will post a link to an external site where the captions can be viewed. I will also post a link to the Code of Conduct and IT support email. Our next presentation is titled, Out of Time, Using OER to Aid Last Minute Hires. Feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Justin, and thank you to all the good people at Open Texas for putting this event on. Um, I know we've gained a lot of information today and will continue to gain information uh, in the next couple of days as well. My co-authors and I uh, wanted to use OER to see if there was a way we could help solve a particular problem uh, in community college land, at least, and that is the last minute hire, uh, perhaps adjuncts that have you know a week or even less than a week to get completely ramped up and ready for a semester quite a daunting task and we thought that not only could faculty and students benefit from this but also admin as well and so this presentation um, is due to the work that we got from a Collin college grant uh, oer grant from the cares act to um, find a way and implement a plan to um, help faculty members who are sort of brought in at the last minute um, where they might be uh, a little bit stressed. From the student perspective, this these statistics should not surprise any of us. We know that the cost of tuition has gone up. We know that the cost of textbooks has gone up and increasingly students are literally being priced out of college due to uh, textbooks and other ancillary materials. And clearly OER can help resolve that issue. So you can see some of the statistics there and, and these aren't even community colleges, these could be private universities or other public universities where students are being asked by researchers, hey, you know, how do you feel about textbooks? And the, the data is quite clear. Uh, they're either not purchasing the textbook, they're dropping the class, uh, they consider it to simply be an unreasonable use of their very scarce resources uh, to buy books that they don't feel they will ever use again. And so we know why OER makes sense for students. Where we wanted to pick up and where our project focuses is can OER help faculty? So as you read that paragraph from Jolly et al. in 2014, they're studying these adjunct hires uh, with very little time to prepare for a semester. And they're still expected to do everything a full timer who's been here for years to do in terms of class preparation, in terms of creating assignments, in terms of getting ramped up and geared up for the semester, um, how to help students, exactly what sort of assessments might we need? Do, do we have a state assessment this semester? All sorts of questions that as full time faculty we've already discussed, we're already familiar with, but for a last minute hire, they may not have any of that information. And so some of these highlighted portions here can be an area where OER can help, can help smooth over that uh, very chaotic uh, transition from not having almost anything to do to having everything to do. Oh, and by the way, school starts tomorrow at 8 a.m. So curriculum concerns, teaching requirements, what textbook will I use? What assessments will I use? All of that hits these last minute hires all at the same time. And Jolly et al found that they are put at an immediate disadvantage in these sorts of situations. And it's almost as though, you know, failure becomes more likely than success at that point. So what if we could use OER to create a to create an entire course full of content with textbook chapters, with assessments, with discussion boards, and give that to the brand new faculty member and say, here you go. Yes, you can change what you want, you can add, subtract, but a lot of the work has now been done for you. And we felt that that would be a tremendous benefit for faculty. However, it's not only faculty. My colleague Mike 
uh, who was a former dean and is now back uh, as a faculty member, very well respected. I love Mike with all my heart. He's going to show us how this project can even help administration. Thanks, Les. And the feeling is mutual, and we appreciate this opportunity to present at Open Texas. And not only was I dean for a couple of years, I was chair for five or six years, so I worked directly with adjuncts. And the years I was chair was uh, pre-OER, or the infancy, infancy of OER. And so when I would hire adjuncts in August, it, it involved a walk to a storage room, trying to find a hardbound book trying to get them in touch with a publisher's representative to connect them to the ancillary resources. And so we feel this uh, OER course we've designed would give some peace of mind because now you could hand the course to the, fat, the new hire on a jump drive if you wanted. Uh, the book we're using is the OpenStax American Government book, which we know is peer reviewed. And that's, a, that's an important thing because there's a lot of unevenness out there in the OER world. It resolves the storage issue real easy. It's easy to keep a drawer of jump drives or send a zip file. And the other thing is our colleague who's not with us today, Patrick LaRue, has written the assessments so they align with our state SLOs. So while, as Les said clearly, uh, the, the new hire is free to edit, adapt, add their own test questions, if they're hired on the Thursday or Friday before the semester starts, and I don't want to count the number of times I've done that, they don't have to die all weekend developing new tests, new assessments. Uh, th this is about as close to being ready to go as we think we can make it. And so I think administrators, chairs, associate deans, whatever their title is, I think this would also add to their peace of mind at the beginning of the semester and let them focus on other things. Do we need to open up more classes or do we need to cut classes? And now uh, Chris, another good friend, is going to take us through what the course kind of looks like. Thank you, Mike. And uh, so what, what we've built here is a, a totally turnkey, fully OER course meant to address uh, all of these concerns. And I'll, I'll say, you know, I was hired by Mike many moons ago, and I was one of those last minute hires. But using a publisher's, uh, the slides for the publisher's book, uh, and that were 55, 60 slides per chapter, brand new. I had several days to get ready. And that's, yeah, that's overwhelming for brand new faculty. And hopefully this is something that really solves this problem for someone hired at any time, but especially last minute. So there's really something for everyone. For faculty, they can customize it in any way. Uh, it's got links built into it. It has everything that they need. Uh, it's ready to go. They can hit the ground running, um, but they can also edit it as much as they need. There's nothing for them to look for. It's got video lectures built in. It's got readings built in, summaries built in. We'll look at all of that in a minute. Um, but it's, it's got everything that they need, but it's also very customizable. So they can easily reorder the chapters by just moving modules around. They can schedule their due dates however they want. They can lump things together. Uh, they can uh, unpublish parts of it and, and leave, leave bits out that, that they think are that, that fit their course the best. Um, so it's, it's really amazing for faculty. And as far as hiring managers, it, there's no more stress of, of putting a, a brand new faculty into a situation where they're swamped by all of the resources and have no way to put something together. Plus, uh, there's no needing to figure out what book there is. They don't have to pre-decide a book for an unfilled class. They don't have to quickly get in an order for a book. Uh, because it's all right there contained self in the course. And then upper admin, is, as Mike mentioned, every SLO is linked throughout the course. And so you can see on any assessment um, what SLOs, the, the student learning outcomes set by the state, uh, what are addressed and where, and it's fully ADA compliant. So it, it is everything uh, that, that anyone would want, hopefully. Uh, so here you can see um, the, this is just the question banks that we have, just a, a screenshot of a part of it. There are uh, about 15 to 30 questions right now for every single question bank. Our colleague uh, Patrick 
um, wrote these questions out. So these, these are good for every chapter. We have quizzes that are already made in it, so they can use them right off the bat, or they can add questions from the question bank. They can um, make them larger quizzes or smaller quizzes. Um, the question banks are all editable by the professor, so they can go in and add more questions if they see fit. Uh, they can use specific questions or they can have it randomly select questions. Uh, again, the great thing about it is it's totally customizable as much as they want to do it, especially that, that first semester. Um, and then it's also got down below short answers for every single chapter. Um, so not only multiple choice, but short answer questions built in as well. There's about five to 10 for every single chapter. Um, okay, and one thing that I didn't mention is we're using this right now. Um, I am, Mike is, and I'm pretty sure uh, Les is as well. Uh, we're all using this in courses this semester. Uh, and, it, and for me, at least so far, it, it is working excellent. The students are, are seem to be liking it, especially they're not having to pay for it. It's, it's flowing really well. Um, everything is, is, is great so far. Um, this is an outline. The, this is really great the way that it's laid out. Uh, the first two links there are links to some video lectures, um, and then you have a PowerPoint that's built in for it, and then the introduction in, in the book, each of the parts of the chapter for the readings. But it also includes key terms and a summary of the chapter. And so it's got a little bit for everyone um, to be able to really uh, immerse themselves in the content, um, plus some review questions and some critical thinking questions, which are just multiple choice and then short answer. They're pretty simple. I use them in my class for uh, in-class questions, uh, some spot checks on the reading. Um, and then I use the other assessments that were built uh, for actual uh, deeper checks on the reading. Um, everything, again, I can't stress this enough. Um, I tell the students that the, the uh, I just kind of went two places. Everything is so customizable, um, but so ready. And I think that we did a good balance of the two of those um, so that we satisfy all of the issues for a brand new hire, um, but it's not something that they gotta use right away and then jump out of. It's something that they can make their own as they continue teaching. Um, and I tell the students, make any of these links a permanent link. Um, just put it as a, short top, a short, shortcut on your desktop. And that will allow you to go right back to it without having to go into Canvas every time and click on the link for the next chapter. They can just scroll through uh, the next chapter. You won't need to be in Canvas every time. And that seems to help a lot of them read it on their phones these days. And it's fully accessible on the phone as well. Uh, and so that, that really makes it just all around extremely useful. So with that, if there are any questions. Check the chat. Uh, let's see, Bruce said, do you plan on making this course public? If so, what format would you disseminate it in? Oh, that's a good question. That is, uh, I don't think, Bruce, we've thought that far. Um, that is certainly something for the future where we had sort of left it for right now is do we want to go through at least Colin College's process um, to get this web ready to go through um, the various quality matters, assurance checks um, to make it web ready, but making it fully public um, is something we can certainly consider for next steps. I appreciate that comment. That's something to, to write down. I appreciate that. Um, Maria's question. There is a Texas government OER book available published by uh, Austin Community College. Uh, Chris Sego is the author and it's on the uh, Texas uh, OER website, or if you just put in Texas government OER, the thing to be careful about is that there's a 1.0 version and a 2.0 version. You really want the 2.0 version because there's a big difference in quality in my judgment between the two. 
I used the Texas government OER 2.0 this summer. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So, so far, uh, let's see, Cynthia asked, how do you cope with cheat sites on the internet, which lists the answers to all of an instructor's test quizzes, et cetera, especially if multiple instructors, instructors are using the material? Um, I, I can speak for myself. Uh, that's something that I've kind of come to accept. Um, so, five minutes. I do, um, my, in, my final exams are in class. Um, I, I, you know, the world is what it is. And um, I, I, I've just kind of come to accept it as far as the quizzes by chapter. Um, but that's why I do my final exams in class. And they're based off the material uh, found in the quizzes, but they're not the same questions. I don't know how Les or Mike handle that. I think uh, one of the particular ways is perhaps to rotate through the question bank. Um, and at each semester, grab a different group of questions. Uh, that could be a potential solution. Um, one of the things I'm doing right now, I give weekly quizzes from the questions that, that Patrick made for us. And um, I rotate the answers. I shuffle the answers. And I'm in a high school. And so these students know each other. And yet we've been doing it for five weeks now. And I've seen absolutely no evidence of cheating because once the quiz is over, I take them up so that they can't share them with their friends. Um, but even since I rotate the answers, they wouldn't be able to just talk to each other and say, oh, yeah, on Stanoland's quiz, it's A, D, C, B, D. They wouldn't be able to do that because the answers are rotated. Um, and so I think that's been working well and certainly um, altering the questions, taking different questions out of the test bank every semester would be another way to at least limit cheating. We know we are fighting an uphill battle with that, uh, but that is a potential solution as well. Thank you, Sharon. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the presenters. What I'm going to do now is stop the recording. If you'd like to stay in the room and continue discussing, feel free.